turn the grave into a new beginning. Our God is risen. You're alive and breathing. There's nothing that can rot against your victory. Your name is higher stay. Your name, your name. Yeah. 
Because of who you are, I give you glory. Because of who you are, I give you praise. Because of who you
seated on the throne, clothed in glory, exalted
we say you're holy. And there's nothing that compares to you. You are like nothing that we can compare you to. You are so set apart. Beautiful, wonderful. As you said to Moses, merciful and gracious. Moses said, show us your ways. And then he says, show us your glory. Show me your face. You can take the world. We want you. 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 All that you've called us to, we are unable to do without you. The Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, first and last, the substance of life in all things. We need you. We live for you. We have life because of you. We say thank you. Oh, we say thank you for not leaving us in darkness. God, Jesus, for coming and redeeming, rescuing, shining your light upon us in the midst of deep darkness, setting us free. We say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For being merciful and gracious a thousand times over, we say thank you. For not treating us as a judge, but a father. Oh, we say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We bless your holy name. We bless your holy name. And in it, all that you are, we bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May you receive tonight our worship as an offering of our thankfulness for who you are to us. We love you. We love you. Amen. Amen, amen. She level to to be. Ye level shatana ele. She level to no ele. Part of Hunter ele. How's everyone doing tonight? <coughs> On this Saturday night. Got to shake things up a bit, right? Guys excited to be in the house tonight? Thank you for coming, even though we had to change Monday to Saturday night, kind of last minute, but uh, sometimes we need to do that, right? Sometimes we need to shake things up a bit. We can get too complacent, get in too much of a rut, and we got to make sure we're still awake, <laughs> Right? Come on. Um, so tomorrow morning, Bishop Bart will be with us for our one service. Amen. Come on. How many of you are excited for tonight? Have Bishop Bart in the house. Amen. Well, 10 a.m., we're doing one service tomorrow morning, uh, and then here in Belfair, and then we're going to have a potluck afterwards uh, celebrating Apostle Katie's birthday. Come on. 
And then tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. at our new building in Tacoma, we'll be doing a service as well. We're going to be dedicating the building, and there will be a commissioning of Apostle Katie, and we're going to be commissioning a deacon. So uh, try to make it out for that if you can. Uh, the 6 p.m. tomorrow in Tacoma. And then we wanted to announce as well, we have some upcoming Sozo nights. So for next month in April, uh, we're going to have uh, Matt Sorger. Anyone ever heard of Matt Sorger? He's a mighty man of God. Uh, we're going to have him on April 22nd in Belfair and April uh, 23rd in Tacoma. So make sure you uh, mark your calendars for those. And uh, how many of you are excited for uh, next Sunday? You know what next Sunday is? Easter. Easter. Come on. Easter service, Sunday morning, uh, 9 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. here in Belfair. And also, it's going to be the launch of uh, Sozo Tacoma. Isn't that exciting? Come on. Um, also, uh, with having Bishop Bart here, uh, he brought some amazing books that are for sale in the bookstore. So uh, please pick them up, buy them, read them, uh, buy one for a friend, you know, if you think someone needs it. Uh, they will change your life, as, as you just said, yeah. Uh, really, really amazing books. Three books that he brought with him. Um, <clears throat> the Cover Me in the Day of Battle, The Scent, The Remove, The Disqualified, and The 5G Shift. Uh, so really powerful books. Bishop Barr was telling us today that the Cover Me in the Day of Battle and the Scent uh, book are basically two sides of the same coin. They go together. So if you get one, get the other one and read them. Uh, really, really powerful books. Um, so we have a, a, a moment we want to do with my beautiful wife. Would you welcome my wife to the stage? She has some exciting things that she wants to share with you. Thank you. Also, I just want to mention, um, for those of you who may be visiting and you're not um, planted in this house, and maybe you're looking for somewhere, you're looking for a home, um, we do have connection cards. So if you would, fill out a connection card. Um, we want to connect with you. We want to let you know about how you can get plugged into this house. Um, so if you would, fill one of those out, and you can bring those up here to the white baskets on either side of the stage. We have some beautiful ladies um, and handsome man, um, passing those out. If you if you need one of those, just stick your hand up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I also just have the the privilege of inviting you in to be a part of something very special, very dear to my heart. I know many of you in this room may already know about it, may already be partnered, but that is um, the organization called Walk in the Light International that I have the amazing privilege of stewarding. Um, it's a work planted in Burkina Faso, West Africa, planted by our apostles, Tom and Katie. And really... To sum up Walk in the Light International and what we do, it's, it's this dream and this vision that God has given us to see a nation rise, a nation to be transformed by the kingdom of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Burkina Faso is a nation that has been um, just under deep oppression for years and years and years. And we have a dream of seeing that change and seeing that broken. Amen, and we know that God is strong to do that, and that he's, he is more than able to do that. And so, um, through Walk in the Light, we have um, done many things, planted schools, we've brought um, clean water, health care, um, dental care, um, and we've started a school of ministry to raise people up to be ministers and pastors in the nation. Um, and I wanna go ahead and, we have a video. I wanna go ahead and play a video because um, sometimes a picture is better than words. And then um, I'll come back up and share a bit more with you after the video. If it's ready, we'll go ahead and run that. Walk in the light. It's not just a brand. It's not a business strategy or a mission statement. It's a mandate from heaven. Jesus said, go into all the world. Preach the gospel. 
make disciples, love your neighbor, instruct your children, feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, heal the sick, cast out demons. Walk in the light as He is in the light. So we bring the light. We bring wholeness wherever we go. We are ambassadors of joy, healing, justice, and reconciliation. We will bring the kingdom of heaven to the farthest corners and the darkest places until earth looks like heaven. said, go, and we say, yes. Amen. Amen. So that is just a beautiful representation of Walk in the Light International, and um, you know, we, we are pouring into these kids. We care for around 2,000 kids. And uh, we truly believe that they're the ones that are gonna change their nation. And um, we have a child sponsorship program and that's how we care for the children. And the child sponsorship program um, provides for their spiritual needs um, through a discipleship program. Um, they're able to um, receive the gospel. Just this last year, we saw uh, thousands of kids uh, hundreds of kids give their lives to Jesus, many of them first-generation Christians. And, um, and then we also, just sponsorship provides for all of their school fees so that they can go to school and get an education and, and be the ones that break out of that cycle that maybe their family has been in for years. Some of them may be the first ones in their family to go to school. And they're gonna be the ones that break that cycle off of their family. And, um, and through sponsorship, you know, in a, in a nation like Africa, there are so many needs that these children have. And so sponsorship also provides for them to get clean water, to get health care, um, and to get dental care. And so I wanna give you the opportunity today, if you wanna be, if you have the means and, and you feel that in your heart, that you wanna say yes to one of these children and to truly, it transforms their life and to give them a hope for a future. If, that, if you feel led to do that, um, if you just stick your hand up, um, one of these amazing people will, will hand you a profile. And, um, and if you need to take a moment and pray about it, you can do that. Um, and they can bring you one. And if you just want more information about Walk in the Light, uh, we do have a table over by the door and I'll be there and I would love to just tell you more and answer any questions that you may have. So, amen, thank you. Uh, and I just say thank you to Rachel for champion Walk in the Light. And it's been amazing to watch what God's been doing over the years and uh, just every year to see the things we just say, okay, yes, God, and then to watch him do what he does uh, with a yes. So um, I'm excited for uh, this weekend to have uh, Bishop with us. We want to um, sow a seed to honor and to bless his life, uh, to honor what's on his life, and to say, God, what's on his life may spiritually, yes, the, the word that's going to be brought is going to... Um, uh, bless your life, but I'm believing as well as we've talked about honoring and sowing and blessing to say, I honor what's on your life. Lord, 
may it be upon mine. What you've done in their life, what you've uh, deposited, Lord, let it be released, Lord. I need grace to be able to accomplish. So uh, we're going to bless, we're going to sow seed, we're going to honor, and we're going to receive with honor by blessing. And so if you have um, that ready, go ahead and begin to bring that uh, forward. If you need an envelope, um, there's one in the back of your seat, but also you can raise your hand. Let's begin to bring that offering now. And just to our guests, um, I, I just always share this with uh, our own family, so I don't have to share it with them because they know it. I really challenge every person, uh, if you're a guest, you're kind of new, uh, to, get, to, to bring just some, something, you know, to, to um, uh, I, this is my, my challenge to uh, my kids, to, uh, to anyone, is um, I, I don't come to the house of God in general with I, I just I just have got this deep in my heart um, that it's it's better to give than to receive, and so tonight I know I want to receive, but um, I, I there's a principle in 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 sowing and blessing um, that if you can get into your heart, um, there is something there connected in the scriptures. I don't have time to kind of hit all of it, but that does release something on your life when you when you catch this. We come to things like this. We see men, men and women of God who carry something on their lives. And we want, to, we want them to bless us because we recognize God has blessed them and it can be um, released upon us. Um, but I just, I'm just telling you to learn, those of you who are guests, um, to give something just to say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to receive. Of course, I want to receive. I want God to, to locate me. Um, but I want to be someone who also gives. And so I've, I've just really challenged you to, to grow in that way. I see some people still preparing. Does anyone need another second? Okay, a couple more. Okay. Um, Bishop Bart, his, uh, I'm going to let him, he's going to do way better than, than me. Um, for those of you who weren't here for the School of Ministry time, um, Bishop uh, spoke at uh, ICAL, the International Coalition of Apostolic Leaders in Dallas. I think the last two years that I've been there, he's spoken at both times. But the first year when I was there, when he got up to speak, I was being blessed by the different um, apostles who were sharing. But when Bishop got up and spoke, I felt it in the room at a level not to say, you know, and Bishop Minoza wouldn't be saying, you know, oh, okay, these other guys, okay, yeah, that was cute, but let me, you know, bring the word, you know. So it wasn't that at all, but um, maybe something on his life that was meant for my life, because when he began to speak, something inside of me said, you, mu you must connect. And, um, but I could also tell that he had somewhere to go, so after he spoke, he was, uh, oh, I saw him in the lobby waiting to leave. And that the, the, his bags were with him. We got another day of the conference. He's leaving early. I'm sure he got in trouble from John Kelly. But, um, <laughs> um, which is uh, Israel Kim, my apostle's uh, apostle. John Kelly's amazing. And, um, and so he's there with his bags. And I'm like, I'm going to miss my opportunity. He's leaving. And I joke because there was a, a, a German evangelist you know, um, I know God has, has, has used Reinhard Bonnke. You know, who, how many of you know who Reinhard Bonnke is? So this German, I'm sure would give Reinhard a run for his money. Uh, he was just so excited. I think he was talking 100 million salvations. And he was just, you know, just really just very, um, 
I thought he was trying to sell Amway or something to, to Bishop, but I'm um, joking. But he was trying to convince Bishop of something to, to join him on some something. But um, I was like, man, I don't know if I'm going to get an opportunity. I'm, I'm definitely not going to try to cut off this German. And, um, and I'm, so I'm sitting there, though. I'm sitting there. I'm, I'm sitting at the, t- acting like I'm not, you know, I'm just like, just, just very close and trying to get how close can I get without being noticed. And um, Bishop has a moment where he kind of finally k- finds a way to get the German to stop talking and, sh- and, and share a story. And when he does, he, he says, well, my friend Wendell Smith. And when he said that, I go, that's my opportunity because I went to Wendell's church when I went to Northwest University. And so Wendell is an amazing man of God who um, shook this region um, and uh, city church there in Kirkland and uh, just a general, wonderful man of God. And uh, when he spoke, you, same thing, you could feel um, just his genuine conviction and love and just depth with God. And uh, so when he said, I said, my opportunity. And I said, oh, when? I? And, and, and so, and then we started chatting, and then I was like, got it. You know, the German had to take the back seat. So, um, so uh, I caught my, I, you know, you talked about it in the, in the training. I'm not sure which part earlier today or to, or to, um, to get a spirit of pursuit or, or, or what was that? apprehend, get a spirit of apprehension to, to actually take hold of what the Lord wants you to take hold of, that you would pursue it to actually take. If you go fishing, you want to catch salmon, you don't want the, you don't want the rock fish, you want the salmon. So you have to put the right thing on the bait to get the salmon, right? So you don't get the squid or the rock fish, you get the salmon. So I had I had apprehended <laughs> what I wanted to apprehend, and uh, which was, um, you know, to have a conversation to connect because I, I sensed, I didn't know quite what it was, but that what was on his life, that there was something there that I was to, um, to apprehend. And so we've um, spent the last two years getting to know each other, and I've apprehended uh, a lot. So I'm very honored to have him here, this beautiful bride, um, and for you to apprehend, to take hold of uh, what the Lord has deposited in his life. I think you're going to be blessed. So very honored. I'm going to. So Lord, we heave to you an offering, a seed, offering a free will, joyful uh, offering that, Lord, we intend to give to your priest, to give to your um, son, to give to your servant. And, uh, but Lord, we know when we give to him, really we're giving to you. It's an offering, Lord, a sacrifice. We ask that you receive it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I'll let Bishop, he's going to share a bit about his, himself, I'm sure. Uh, and so I won't do any other further introduction, but would you uh, honor Bishop Bart Pierce as he comes? <laughs> thank you, thank you. <clears throat> wow, that's quite a story. <laughs> but it's, it's really a lot of truth. What do we, what do we, oh, you need a Bible. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was saying, I didn't, I didn't print that book. <laughs> oh, anyway, that's a good book. Um, it was so funny, that story, because uh, I go to the German. Uh, I meet a lot of people, and I love doing that. I love meeting all kinds of people. And uh, this guy was wired 220, man. He was just... <laughs> And it's very seldom that someone's talking that I don't get a chance to talk. <laughs> and Tom, actually, when he jumped in, he rescued me. <laughs> but he was trying to bring 220 million people on the day of Pentecost to pray. Amazing guy. I brought my girlfriend. <laughs> I left my wife and brought my girlfriend. We've been together 53 years and a, a month 
a month and about a week and a half, a month or so, six, uh, five weeks, we will be married 54 years. We've been together for about 57, 57 years. And um, just, I, you know, I, I tell the story that when I saw her, uh, I, was, I grew up on the beach. I grew up in Virginia Beach and in a place called Cape Hatteras. And I went to high school, a place called Cocoa Beach in Florida. And um, I grew up in the ocean. I am a full-blown waterman and uh, been in the water all my life. And uh, all my distant family is all watermen. And uh, so she came on the beach and I had four of my buds sitting, in, three of my buds sitting in the car with me and surfboards on top of my car. And I was a pro surfer and uh, surfed all over the world. And they paid for all my clothes and my surfboards and all that stuff. And so I'm sitting there and I see this girl in this little bikini well, I was back in the day, you know what I'm saying? And I, uh, I say to her that, I say to people that, I looked at her and say, me Tarzan, you Jane. And I said, we ended up with a bunch of little cheetahs, but I'm telling you, <laughs> this is Coralie, and uh, she has just been a joy to just come into my life. I met Jesus, but I met her and uh, first, and uh, those are the two greatest things that happened in my life. And uh, so it's a joy to have her. If I said, do you want to sh talk, she'll say no. Do you want to say something? No, I just welcome you. First. So, um, yeah, I wanted, to, I wanted to come, and, and it's always fun to travel with him. He needs somebody to fix his record. We've been married a long time, and friends, and since high school, really. You know, so I'm like, they never like to go to South Korea. We never look back. Great grands. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> but it's, a, it's been a wonderful journey. It's just a real joy to come with you all. And, um, uh, hopefully this will be the only time. Yeah. We have seven grands and one and a half great grands. Or, yeah, one on the way. So it was seven and a half, that's why. It's still in the cooker. But anyway, thank you for, Pastor, for bringing us in. And uh, you guys, we enjoy just getting to know you and, and seeing that there's a, a common bond there. There's some things. You know, I meet a lot of people, but when you meet somebody, there's something inside that connects. And uh, that's what happened you know, that, that two years ago. And uh, I'm thankful for that. I had the privilege of meeting a lot of great people too. And um, from great revivalists and to all levels of people. And um, I'm really, really pleased to what I see and what's happening here. And it's just been a joy. Um, let me get into the word because I know again, we're on our time a little bit. So I wanna, <clears throat> huh? You're free. I'm free? Yeah. Oh yeah, you don't know, you don't know. When, how many of you read the book, God Chaser? Anybody ever read that book? Uh, that was written by a guy named Tommy Tenney. And Tommy was in my church for three and a half years. He wrote the book in my church. So the stories that you read in the book was the stories of our church. Tommy's not well right now. He's in France and he collapsed and he's been in a coma for quite a while. Uh, he did come out recently and I'm not sure today uh, what the condition is, but he did come out of the coma a little bit. So just keep him in prayer when you think about it. Uh, but anyway, let's, uh, let's go into the word for a minute. And, uh, <clears throat> I want to talk to you about a subject that, that really I believe 
is so important for this day. And because of the prophetic gift in my life, I oftentimes end up in some prophetic uh, mode of the messages that God gives me to preach. So uh, I feel that this may be a real prophetic word for this church, for this time. And uh, there's two scriptures I'll start with, but I want to talk to you about gates and thresholds. Gates, you know, gates, open gates, okay, and thresholds. And I'm going to give you a, a little background with it as I go along. Now, I, I tell stories a lot. Um, I said earlier that Cindy Jacobs was telling me one day I need to write a book on my stories. For some reason, I prayed a prayer when I first got saved and said, Lord, if I can't do it, don't show it to me. And <clears throat> I'm not a, a, a theorist. I'm a practitioner. And, and I believe very strongly that what God's word says we can do. I've seen the eyes that are blind open. I've seen the cripples get out of their chairs. I've seen these things, and uh, I know that God does those things. I've seen uh, the, the dead raised. And I had a boy that I prayed for it was in his mother eight months, and they said, he's dead. And we're going to wait till you come to the full term and then we'll take the child. She didn't have a, hardly any showing or anything. And they came, the whole family was in my church and they came and I just kind of got mad at the devil. And I smacked her on the belly and I said, uh, in the name of Jesus, I speak to you, come back now. And within about six weeks today, he's about six, three, six foot three. And uh, just, and she had, she had all the records. So the key is, is that I believe that we can practice, we can walk in what we preach. Amen. So Micah chapter two, verse 13. Let's start there a minute. Do you guys put scriptures on the, okay, that'll help me if I, if I can use that. Um, is this, it was on, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, <clears throat> the one who breaks open, will come up before them. They will break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. Their king will pass before them with the Lord at their head. Okay, where's it at? Oh. Oh my God. I need a telescope. Micah chapter two, verse 13. That's not a good sign. When the Lord turns his back to you, you need to see his face, not his back. Anyway, I'll read it. That's too tiny. I can't even hardly see that that's there. Uh, let me, okay, I figured they would. That's why I was picking on them. I'm used to guys like you, and I work with y'all all the time, and I love, there you go, a little bit bigger would help, but if you do it that size, it's okay. I appreciate you, but you gotta help me. There you go, nice going. The one who breaks open will come up before them, and they will break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. Their king will pass before them, and the Lord at their head. I believe that that's a declaration of how the church needs to come out, come through the gate of the next opportunities. We're coming out of something, going into something. We came out of COVID, we're going into something, amen? And, and we, need to, we need to get ourselves in that attitude. When God came to Joshua and said, in three days you're going across, he said, get the people ready. And I believe that this is the season right now to prepare God's people for some things that are coming and also for where we're going. But we've got to go through the gate. Are you listening now? There's a gateway. And Isaiah 45, verse seven. That's another one to look at. And I'll come back and I'll preach around this in a minute. I will go before you and make crooked places straight. Let me see that. I will go before you and make crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze, brass, 
and cut the bars of iron. Now you gotta understand, iron is always representative of man, man's metal. Metal in the scriptures gives us a parallel. Gold, of course, is God. Silver is redemption, et cetera, et cetera. And so when you see anything about iron, okay, what you're dealing with is the iron is human, it's humanity, okay? So it says, I will break in pieces the gates of bronze or brass and cut the bars of iron, Babylon's gates, hundreds of them. Now, Babylon is the culture of what we know in, in the Old Testament where uh, Daniel was taken into captivity. Nebuchadnezzar was the, the dictator king of that uh, organization, of that structure, of that government, of that big giant city. What a fabulous building place it was. It was an architectural uh, wonder. I'm a builder from background. I've been building houses and buildings all my life. And uh, my wife and I have lived in 30 different houses. I build them and then sell them and, and so on. And so I understand construction. Every building that I have up my build, up at my church, I build it, I designed it, I drew it, and then we build it. And uh, most of the construction, uh, except some of the steel things, we did our work ourselves. Uh, and uh, so I've been around this. So I understand this point here about Babylon's gates. Babylon's gates. This guy's got to not be in competition for me. <laughs> I'll give him a mic. I'll buy him one and send it to him. But today's not his time. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. I know she's not offended. Amen. Now, I'll go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze, brass, cut out the bars of iron. Babylon's gates, hundreds of them. So Babylon structure, today we're living in Babylonian structure. Our government, our operation is not communism, socialism, it's Babylonias. That's what we're living in right now. That's why if you'll look at scripture, you're gonna see some things that in Revelation, it talks about that there is a, another Babylon and that Babylon is the culture, the, it's the structure of the end time of what we're gonna face. We're in it right now. We walk in a Babylonian uh, society culture. And, and it, I, one thing I'll just tell you about it is there was idols on every corner. They worshiped a multitude. Every God that had existed was on every other corner. You couldn't turn, there wasn't another God. And that's the same way it is in our culture today. Now, in getting to that, let me take you backwards for a minute and uh, we'll look at some. Gates are always places of having to face the future that's in front of us. How many of you know you don't back up to a gate, you face a gate? And when you go to the gate, there's some things to understand about the gate and about how it has to open. Now, we have miracles that we know in Scripture. Peter comes out of prison, walks into the city, and the gates open before him. The angel of the Lord opened them, and he didn't touch the gates. So God's going to show us that he'll open the gates of man's structure. He'll open those gates so we can pass in and become effective in the culture we live in. And have you know that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the onslaught of the church. So the church is supposed to be on an, uh, a, a positive, but a, uh, you know, the, the front, uh, confront those gates. That's what we're supposed to do. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the onslaught of the church. And they take it by force. Are you hearing me? There are places of decision in which we decide to stay where we are. Are you listening? They're, they're, my voice has got these kids activated, I'll tell you. <laughs> the places of decision is which in the, there are places in decision in which we decide to stay where we are or we risk all and move forward. There are times in your life that you come to a place to say, I gotta go all the way here. I can't just kinda you know, come up to it and walk away, but I go all the way. 
And I came out of all the drugs and all the jails and all the, had a contract on my head to be shot uh, and I was wanted by the police. And when I got saved, I had drugs in my pocket and it's a miracle that I got saved. I punched my principal in the stomach in the fifth grade, thrown out of school in the eighth grade. And it's funny, the eighth grade teacher that threw me out, he literally grabbed me by the back of my pants, threw me in the hall. The The principal came and said, you must take him back in the class. And the teacher said, if you put him in my class, I quit. So I, I wasn't the most popular student. And, but God's got a sense of humor. Many years, 100 years later, I'm teaching about 80 to 100 people in first principles at my church in Virginia Beach. And I'm teaching away. And this bald-headed man that I didn't recognize, he all of a sudden stands up and goes, my God, Bart Pierce. And, and I went, Mr. Hendricks. He came down, we hugged, told the story, and uh, God's a God of redemption, amen? Here I was teaching him. Oh, what a, I walked away and went, good stuff, man. (laughs) Anyway, there are places and times, places of decision in which we decide to stay where we are or risk all we have to move forward. There are places. I mean, you know, God has a place before he has a people. There are places that God brings us. He's brought you to a new place. This is the prophetic piece. This is a new day. You've done what you've done for a number of years, but this is not the same place. How many of you know we woke up one morning and COVID changed America, changed the world? But it wasn't COVID. There was something else at work. God took by his hand and he turned the dial of eternity. He turned it forward. The Bible says if if it weren't for the Lord doing that, the very elect would be deceived. If God didn't advance the calendar of heaven and move it forward, we couldn't survive the process. We'd get deceived. So God took his hand and he turned the clock of eternity and moved everything forward. And we felt the jerk as it moved us. We saw it as sickness and virus and people dying and all that, but it was really the hand of God said, no, I'm moving my people to another place. And how do you know we can't go back? We can't go back. We have to realize God changed something in the heavenlies. And because of it, we're at a new place. You're at a new place. I don't care what part of culture, society, life, age, time you're in. I'm 74 years old. I've lived a little bit. And I understand that when God makes us, brings us to a place of move, you have to let go of things and move with God. If you don't, you'll hold on to what he did and you'll never experience what he wants to do. Now, remember to, remember, remembering to make a decision to stay where we are, we are actually making a decision to go backwards. It, it, is a, it is the gate that God gives us an opportunity to go, and, and, and we need to understand, it is at the gate, it's at the gate that God brings us, that God gives us an opportunity to go forward or go backwards. Choose you this day. Right? Choose you this day. First Kings 8, 2. Elijah challenged the people, said, how long will you halt between two opinions? Yes. I mean, here, opinion is a fact. That's what the definition is. People think it's a su- suggestion. An opinion, the definition, Webster says, a definition for opinion is it's a fact. So when somebody says, I'm going to give you an opinion, they're trying to tell you something that there's a fact. Hello? Not just a suggestion. But we stand there, Elijah said, how long are you going to halt between two opinions? Do I go forward or do I back up? We're going to get to a place where the church can say, you know what? We're comfortable without God in the church. We've learned over the years to have church without God. And then all of a sudden, he dare come in and interrupt our service? 
And all of a sudden now, we find ourselves at a place we want to worship and we feel his presence. When God showed up in my church that we had this outpouring of God, his presence overwhelmed our church. For the Sunday when he first came in so strong, the whole church was on the floor weeping and crying all day till one, two in the morning. Children were in the one room, one classroom, had a hundred and some kids in there. And they were on their faces crying till there were puddles of, of water around their heads the size of dinner plates. When God comes in, it's like Isaiah. See, uh, Isaiah said the, you know, that uh, Uzziah had died. King Uzziah was dead. He said, I see the Lord high and lifted up. And his train comes in and fills the temple. That train is like a woman's uh, train that when she puts it on in a wedding and that it comes in. But when it comes in, it keeps coming in. You see, when God comes into a place, he comes in and he keeps coming. And where God's been, he'll come again. He's attracted to his own presence. Just read about the tabernacle. God is attracted to his own presence. Where he's been, he senses, he feels that that's a place that he's welcomed. And when we move and step forward in the day that's coming, we're going to begin to entertain God in a way we've never realized. But we're at the gate. And some of the church are not going to go through the gate. Some are not going to go through. Some are standing at the gate and they're halting. They're trying to figure, well, if I go, it's really going to cut. Going to church, giving myself, going to Africa, going to these places, doing all this, it's really going to cost me. And I'm so comfortable with my little bit of this and my little bit of that and my little restaurants I go to and my little bit of this and little bit of that. And God's going to put pressure on the church and he's speaking prophetically. How long are you going to stand there at the gate and halt? Now, gates also represent places of crises. Just because there's a gate in front of us doesn't mean it's a crisis, though. It becomes a crisis simply because of the way we respond to the gate. There's a conflict raging in our will oftentimes. How many of you know suke, that's the Greek word for your soul, is always in conflict? And your suke is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Those three units of your body, of your makeup, they're always in competition with the spirit of the penuma of God. There's always this pressure. Should I? Well, I don't know. I got to give, but I don't know if I can. I got to give, but I got to pay bills. Suke is always getting you to think about yourself rather than the Bible says that Jesus said this, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Come on. Now, there's a conflict raging in our will. The debate over our will creates an internal uh, war. There's an internal war going on right now in the church. Look, a lot of churches, 33% of all the churches in America did not reopen after COVID. Because people came to the gate and they said, look, my city, when they said, you know, the state of Maryland said that we couldn't have church, I bucked it and we weren't out but three weeks and I wrote a letter to my county executive and and said to him uh, you're going to crush the economy this this region to our city you've got to not stand in front of the press and tell people we can't go back to church and I sent him photographs that my people went out and took of Home Depot and of Walmart and their parking lots were full but the church couldn't have church. And so I sent him pictures and everything and said, you don't want to do this. Now, because of what I do in my city, when I feed 65,000 people, when I have houses, I give away 22 houses for 22 years, a house to people for free to have never owned a home. When I do these things, I've earned a right to speak to those people that are in legislation. Plus one of the men in my church is his assistant. So I can get anything I want to him. So I wrote a letter, sent the pictures, sent it to him. He called a press conference on Monday. And I said, well, here we go. And all of a sudden, he canceled the press conference. Well, I thought, well, okay, maybe something's working. Wednesday came out and said, we decided that it's going to be all right to go back to church percentage of how many people, and they laid it out, how many people could go back. And my people came right back. But let me tell you another part. 
when, when I shut down my school, I have a, a, you know, a, a school K through. And so I shut it down because the whole state said every school had to shut down. Three days after I shut it down, the governor's office called me and the, and the head of the secretary of, of uh, education was there with him in the office and said, oh, the governor wants me to ask you this, that if you'll open your school back up, the governor said, and open it to first responders, the governor will pay all your bills for every one of the students that comes there and you can hire the teachers you need to hire and we'd like to use your school to send all of the doctors, all the firemen, all the nurses, all those kind of people to your church. I closed it three days after I closed it. Five days later, my school tripled. I had doctors, I had, I had fire chiefs, I had, and today that's still multiplying because of that, and they paid all the bills. So I got my state to pay my school, my Christian school bills. Don't tell me that's not a miracle. The point is, is this, is that we often, often get in the opportunity where the greatest blessing is right on the other side of the gate. And tonight, I want some of you to walk through the gate. That's why I'm preaching this. And, and so if we don't recognize it and we don't, you know, we're debating over, you know, this whole process, there's a conflict raging in our will. The debate over our will creates an eternal crisis. And if we don't recognize it and make a clear decision to arise, Isaiah 60 verse one comes to play. And you know what it says, arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will ri arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. And the Gentiles shall come to your light. The Gentiles shall come to your light. That's why the governor's office saw the light that's on our church. And that's how they found their way to open the schools back up the largest juvenile detention center in the state of Maryland, they asked me to sit on the board of it. So I was, I sat on the board. One day I went over and uh, I just did an inspection. I had a little thing, you know, around my neck, little badge like, and I go in and I inspect. And I went into this one dorm and they had it locked up. And I saw a guy standing there and I tapped the window and said, open the door. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, it's closed. And I held that little badge up and I said, do you, I don't know why I said this, but I said, do you want your job? It was just a question. I didn't have any power. And he said, oh, and he opened the door. It was a good question to ask. And so when he opened the door, I went in the hall. There's about 20 rooms and I stopped at this one room. I said, open this door. I tried to get it. I said, open this door. He said, I can't do it. I said, give me the keys, open this door or go out right now because I'll be following you and so will the governor. So he opened the door. There was a kid in there, black kid. He was handcuffed to a bed, had gone to the bathroom all over himself, had been there for a day and a half, weeping and crying. And I called the governor's office. The governor said, uh, tell, tell the bishop that uh, I will be there tomorrow morning with my helicopter to meet me. They flew him in. He came, sat down in the yard of this. This is a heavy juvenile center where murdering kids are in there. And he flew in and he said, uh, Reverend, he said, thank you. Here's what we're going to do. And I said back to him, uh, uh, Governor, would you mind if I meet with some men and we take this whole program back from the state and make it private? He said, can you do that? I had no clue. <laughs> but see, I don't live there. I live, I speak to the thing that isn't as though it is. So I simply said to him, I said, yes, sir, I can do it. I got a hold of, you ever heard of Jiffy Lube? Y'all don't have it out here. Do you have it out here? Well, the man that founded it was right down the street from us. And so I went to him and a, a doctor from John Hopkins, I met at a restaurant, we put it together and we took that organization out of the state's hand. I brought in a, a contractor from Colorado and they took it over and I put the first chaplain they'd ever had in there and we took that juvie center back over. <clears throat> now, what I'm telling you is you get to a gate and you got to decide, am I going in? Because it takes everything to go in. You can stay back or you can go in. I've never been a person that hesitated. I surfed waves bigger than your building. And when you take off, you don't have a chance to get halfway in and go, you know, I don't want to do this. <laughs> 
When you see the reef exposing, exposing itself because of the shallow of the water, you're doing 40 miles an hour in the face of a wave. You don't have a chance to say, I don't think so. You got to go for it. Hello? And, and so Isaiah tells us here that uh, the glory of the Lord shall be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your uh, light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar. Your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant. You, you got to get a hold of it. And, and, and your heart shall swell with joy because of the abundance of the sea, which is people, shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles will come to you. Let me see this. I stepped into a meeting in my city with a guy who approached me and said, I want to open a battered women's home. I already had a girl's home. So I said, all right. He said, I need your experience. Could you go with me when I go to the city fathers and I'm going to speak to this one? Could you go with me and, and just be, you know, there's a moral support. And I said, yeah, no problem. No problem. You're going to help battered women. I'm for it. So I go in, meet this guy's head of the county there and I sit down and he sits down and the two of them start talking. Next thing you know, they get in a fight. They start arguing, yelling at each other, and I'm sitting there going, oh, Jesus, what am I doing in here? And, and so the guy that I came with gets up, walks out, and I'm sitting there with this county executive going, hi, <laughs> um, thank you so much, and I'm sorry, but anyway, thank you. And I'm going out the door. He says, Reverend, hold on a minute, sit down. He said, let me ask you a question. He said, do you know anything about people on drugs and how they get off? I thought, this has got to be. I said, yes. He said, well, he said, we shut down the only drug rehab place in our whole city. We shut it down and we're being sued by legal aid because it's the only facility and we shut it down. And he said, do you know, do you have anything? Well, just before, the week before I got in his office, a man walks up to me in my church and gives me a two-story house and says, I want you to take this house so you can put drug addicts, ex-guys coming off drugs, and you can put them in the house. And I said, I don't want the house. Don't you give me the house. I'll pay rent. Make it cheap, but I'll pay rent. And he said, no matter. Okay, no problem. And so I had two guys that were really struggling. I had a church full of drug addicts, ex. And I had two that were struggling. So I said, put them in the house. I just put them in the house. So, you know, I speak to the thing that it is, as though it is, that isn't. And I said, yes, sir, I have a house for drug addicts. <laughs> two. What's well, a witness? So I, I say, yeah, no problem. So what happens is, <laughs> The guy sits up and he's all excited. He said, great. He said, could you come back in two weeks and talk to me? I want to see what we can do to make something work. I went away, got stupefied. So I came two weeks. He said, oh, by the way, would you do this? Would you find some people who had been on drugs and, and just you know, put their name or something and let me read about them. Cause I've never, he's a Jewish guy. He said, I've never been around any of it. I don't know that people really get free from drugs and all that. So I went back to my church, closed my eyes, did like this, got a whole bunch of people <laughs> and just got their names and their title, their, their description, brought it to him, sat down with a book and gave it to him. He turns and reads it and he didn't talk to me. He just kept reading. Oh, Oh, and there were girls, you know, I was a prostitute, boom, boom, boom. At 13, I was guys, and oh, man, it was heroin, boom, 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 boom. And they're telling these stories. And so each one of them says, and I gave my life to God and he changed me. So he says, he closed the book. He said, Reverend, either this is a lie or it's not. He said, but I got to ask you a question. I've never met a drug addict that's off drugs. I've never met one that ever got off drugs. Could you get one to talk to me? <laughs> so I'm sitting there going, hey, Jesus. <laughs> so I have two bios that I have for my life. One is my bishop's bio, and then I have ones called Black Bart. <laughs> it's true. That's what my nickname was. And it ain't because of my color. I pastor a black church, but it ain't because I'm black. 
And some of these guys don't even know I'm not black. And so, so the process is, I'm sitting there in front of him and I tell him my story in less than 15 minutes. And he's just, he just had hair transplants. And I thought they were gonna blow out. And he says, he says, Reverend, this is incredible. He says to the girl beside his secretary, he said, could you get him some money? And, she, and, and I'm thinking, yes, you can. <laughs> and so we're sitting there, but here's what he did. It was so crazy. He said, Reverend, do you know anything about construction? <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, could you get him some money? Yeah. Can you get, Reverend, if I give you a check for 300,000, could you build a facility? Look, for 300,000, I'll build you anything you want, buddy. So long story, two weeks later, <coughs> hand me my water, babe. Uh, somebody. Uh, two weeks later, I get a call and he says, Reverend, he says, we've got a problem. I'm like, okay, what is it? He said, they made a mistake with the check. I'm figuring, okay, it's probably 100,000, you know, something. He said, they wrote it for 351,000. He said, do you think you could take the extra 51,000? I said, let me pray. As quick as I prayed, and I didn't pray. I just said, yes, the Lord said yes. <laughs> and we built a facility, the 52 bids, 14,000 men went through the program. The point is this, you're going to... You're going to have opportunities and gates are ready to be open for the church. This is the greatest hour the church has ever had. And I'm going to stop telling stories and I'm going to finish the message. But listen tonight. This will help you prophetically in the days ahead. So in this thought, Isaiah 61 tells us, indecisiveness opens the door to negative emotions as well as to the enemy. Enemy. People that are undecided, are undecisive, are double-minded, and they're unstable in all their ways. And the church has been this unstable structure. It's supposed to be the strongest, yet it's the weakest. You got half-baked Christians, some tithe, some don't. Some come to church when they feel like it, some don't. All of that business, and we try to tell the world that they should have our Jesus. They're faithful to their bar, they go to that bar every Friday night. You can't come to church every Sunday. And they're looking, how is it in the world you were faithful, but in the church, you're not. You can say amen or oh me, I don't care. There's a part of the warfare at the gate. Now, right at the gate, there's a threshold. And every gate is your greatest battle. And God's put you in front of a gate. Will it open? Will you push? Will you press? Will it open? If it opens, you've never realized what God wants to do. It's about to be at that moment at the gate. But every gate has a battle. Many are captured by the emotions at the gate. Emotions are feelings. Amen. Hesitation is an issue now in this day. I mean, a lot of people are hesitating. I mean, people are hesitating about everything. Uncertainty. You got people, they're hesitating about what sex they are. They're hesitating about what, what should we bomb is, I mean, uh, walk away from Israel? Should we bomb Gaza? I mean, there's all, should we, should we close the border, leave the border down? I mean, Everything is this hesitation. While we hesitate, Satan plays. Hello. Hesitation is the issue of the day. Hesitation is to be uncertain, indecisive, waver, pause, or delay. Delayed obedience is really disobedience. We hesitate because of fear. God did not give the church a spirit of fear, but a love, power, and a sound mind. I, I've never lived in a place of that. I've never lived in a place of fear. 
I've hunted when I was, when I was uh, 13, 14 years old. I had a paper route, picked up my papers in the morning. I had mush rats that I trapped and I did them in the morning. And then by the time school, and I stole milk off to my neighbor's porch so I could drink it while I was fixing my papers. And so by the time morning came and I had to go to school, I'd already, I'd already accomplished a lot of stuff. And, and being in the swamp, getting the mush rat out of a trap, and there's a big old snake, <laughs> water moccasins and stuff, you kick them, you know. Sure, that's what everybody does. But I was raised in a different level with no fear. I ran cranes, big giant cranes with 300 foot of boom. I ran heavy equipment, bulldozer, backhoes. I've got my own backhoe at the church. Who, what pastor has a backhoe? And... <laughs> I've never lived in that place of fear. And when I got saved, I, I couldn't put it together. Now I'm on the right side. I'm fighting with the king. What should I fear? What should I be afraid of? If God be for me, who can be against me? The attitude has to change. Fear will uncover what we serve in our heart. What you fear, you'll serve. To what are the, we bowing down to? Or of what are we afraid? What will we lose, we say? If I do this, if I commit to the Lordship of Christ, I'm gonna lose my friends. They're not your friends anyway. Are you listening tonight? What we bow down to is what we begin to worship. Faith is how we counter uh, these moments of hesitation and indecision is by faith. I live by faith, walk by faith, get up in the morning, trust God, come on took back that whole juvenile center because I believe God would be with me. Give away houses during, during the financial crisis. I'm giving away homes, a church. Because when we stop trusting God and going through the gates, we let the gate of fear lock us back in. And then we start going backwards. You lose momentum. Are you listening? James 1, 5, and 6, James exhorted the people to stop hesitating when he told them to have faith and not doubt. Let him ask in faith. How many of you want your faith to increase? Okay, good. Now when you get the next opportunity, the way it increases, you gotta do what you believe is the faith you're having faith for. Do you understand? And, and I'm not talking about objects and cars and homes and all of that business. I'm not talking about having faith for that. It don't take faith for that. It takes hard work. I have homes in the Caribbean that are paid for. Why? Because I work hard and I've had businesses and I pay my tithes. I don't have to pray about it. I tell people all the time, oh, I want a new car and I'm praying about it. I said, stop praying, get a second job. You think I'm kidding? I wanted a Porsche. So I collected my money, went into the Porsche dealership, sat down and said, I want a black on black Porsche. Okay. And he said, let me look. He looked on his sheet, said, we don't have one. I said, yes, you do. It's in a boat. It's in a ship in New Jersey. It just came in from Germany. He looked at me like, who are you? He said, just a minute. And he got up and left. And I had my accountant with us, with me, accountant from the church, who's been with me since he's nine. So he's sitting there with me. He said, how did you know that, Bishop? And I looked at him and said, oh, ye of little faith, have you been with me? <laughs> and so I said, watch. He came back in. She knows. He came back in and said, that's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. There's one black car one black on black car on that ship and it just came in from New Jersey. I had a word of knowledge. Now, I told him, I said, I gotta go to Indonesia for two weeks. I said, so when I come back, I want it in the showroom, I want it detailed, and I want that thing they do in movies put around, you know, those little stuff. I want it around it, nobody, I wanna drive it out of the showroom. If you don't want that, I won't give you a check. I'm gonna give you a check, pay for the whole thing right now. If you don't wanna do that, I'll go somewhere else. No, 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 it's okay. I wrote the check, came back in two weeks, got in the showroom, sat down. They moved that, opened the, opened the glass doors. Boom, I fired up and went right out the door. But 
That wasn't because I prayed for a Porsche. I sold extra chairs, extra business work, sold another house, and I paid for what I was believing. We waste prayers by foolishness. There are things that you can't change is where you need to be praying. There are mountains you can't get removed. You need to have faith to pray that way. Don't pray about what you're going to eat. Hello? God's going to take care of it. Don't pray about foolishness. Pray about that which takes faith. Your neighbor's got cancer. Somebody's child's dying. Pray for those things. Mark 8, 34, 36, put it on the board, please. Mark 8, 34, 36, and, and I'll be pushing. Don't, don't panic. I'm, I'm not going to keep you here all night. It's already three in the morning or two in the morning. <laughs> no. I know, I don't pay much attention to mine. I've never had jet lag in all my life. I've been around the world more times than I can count. Never once. Why? Because I don't let my clock tell me what my body's doing. Mark 8, 34, 36. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. How many of you want to say, you know what? I've lived this Christianity for X amount of years. It's time now for me to really commit and demonstrate that I am a believer. Mark said, these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick, and the sick shall recover. They shall cast out demons, and they have to go. It's time that your pastor, his wife, and the team are not the only people that can claim that scripture. You have to claim that. You have to become the believer that changes the culture that you live in, the neighborhood that you live in. It's time that we shift gears and stop letting the preacher be the person who does all these things. You got to walk in this faith. But there's a gate. There's a gate. Crossing over, going through the open gates, passing through the place that has been broken open. The place of breakthrough requires us to give up something that is precious to us, such as an attitude <laughs> uh, we have lived with for years. It may be a person, a security, even a strong desire for our future, like a career. You have to give up something to go through this next gate. This next gate will require you to lay something down. How do you hear that? Remember when they built Nehemiah's wall? It says that they had to leave the rubbish outside before they came in. Leave it outside the wall, put it outside. Some of you, when you come to church this Sunday, wherever it is, here, there, the other one, whichever, I don't know, I'm gonna be at one of them. Uh, when, you go in, when you go in the church, stop for a minute and symbolically just take that excess baggage and leave it right there. And don't go out looking for it when you come out of church. Leave that thing and don't bring it in the house of God. Some of you are so attached to that thing that it's, you have this passion. It, it, it's like a, a, an old unholy alliance to that thing. It may be anything that we hold on to when the only way to get to the other side is to let go of it. I you say, Lord, I'm going to let go of my attitude. I'm going to let go of my negativity. I'm going to let go of, I'm not talking about let go of your husband. Stop, lady, stop, stop. <laughs> not going to happen. To cross over will mean that we let go of that which will not fit through the gate with us. When the gate opens, you can't bring it. How do you hear that? How do you know the planes do that? They got these things you got to put your bag in to test to see because you can't get on the plane. You can't bring. Look, I fly and I see these Nigerian women. I know they've got two, three, four kids in these bags. They're, they're, they're giant. And, and I saw the lady the there at the airport. She was checking everybody in. And she said, she leaned up on the counter and she said, is all of this with you? And the woman didn't even have to say, Yes. I mean, there's the kitchen, there's the living room, there's the bedroom, there's three kids. This is crazy. How do you know when you get on the plane, they make you get rid of the excess? 
Oh, stay with me now. Stay with me. This is important because I told you there's gates and thresholds. Now I'm going to shift. In the next few minutes, I'm going to talk to you about thresholds. See, every gate, every door, I'm a builder, every door has a threshold. When you see the gate open, which is your opportunity that God gives for you, here's where your war is. This is where your war is. The war is at the threshold. Here's why. Now, give you a little bit of a story. So you understand, Micah 2.13, Micah 2.13, the one who breaks open, I read it to you, will come up before them. They will break out, pass through the gate, and go uh, out by it. And their king will pass before them with the Lord at their head. And we say, Lord, you go before me. If God goes before you, it's like Jehoshaphat. We've been in a fast for 21 days. And the process is we're studying, looking at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, where Jehoshaphat is told by the Lord, God says, I'm going to go before you. I'm going to fight for you. When the gate opens, stand still a minute as it opens because he's going to go in front of you. When Peter came out of the prison and went through the city gates, the angel of the Lord went in front of him. Are you listening? Isaiah 45, 7, I will go before you. Make the crooked places straight. God, make these crooked places straight. I will break the pieces, the gates of bronze, brass, cut off the bars of iron, Babylon's gates, there were hundreds of them, and they're about ready to open. How do you know right now, our secular world is starving for somebody to have a solution? Now, they're not admitting it. I don't care which political thing you stand on. I'm talking about the culture in its entirety. The school system is looking for somebody to help. The political system needs somebody to help. The money system needs somebody to help. Are you listening? And God's people are the ones with answers, not just hope. God was saying that the gates were a signature and a structure that was impossible for Israel to break through them sell without help. We need this today. We need the supernatural intervention of God to break through impenetrable gates in order to enter into the new territories and the new places. You're getting ready to dedicate another building, okay? And so you're getting ready to expand your influence. You're expanding what you're doing. But God's telling us, telling me that you're standing at these gates and there are other gates that are there. You just don't see them yet. And when you get to them, God's going to let you believe in faith and the gates are going to open. When they open, go in, go through them. But here's where your war, this is why prayer is the key. Intercessory prayer will be the key for you to get through these next gates. And here it goes. God was saying that these gates were a structure that was impenetrable, uh, impossible for Israel to break through. We need this today. We need supernatural interventions of God to break through the impenetrable gates in order to enter to new territories, new places. Number one, number one, now at every gate is a threshold. So here's the last piece of this. Try to stay with me. I know some of you, it's, it's probably past your bedtime. You're, you're like uh, uh, President Biden. Now, there are two Hebrew words for the word threshold. If, if, you, if you just flow with me, you'll get over it. The Bible says the righteous are bold as a lion. The righteous are bold as a lion. When you live where I do, when you live in prayer and you live in the sanctuary of heaven's grace on your life, then you become bold because the righteous are bold as a lion. And we roar the righteousness of God. The Bible says God stood up and from heaven he roared. We gotta be like him and we gotta roar. Are you hearing? Number one, the word... uh, uh, in the Hebrew is uh, asaf, and it's the doorpost, gate, or threshold. The word is from the root word uh, of this asaf, meaning to snatch away and terminate. The word uh, puthron, puthron uh, from the root word of python, meaning is to twist as a snake. So the threshold definition is the word python. It's a snake. That's what the definition of the Hebrew word for threshold is a python. And how do you know we have a plague of pythons? 
Uh, I don't know if you know that, go to Florida and they've now multiplied to a point where the Everglades uh, down there are overrun. They're eating people's cattle, eating uh, pigs, eating dogs. They're eating family uh, pets. It's amazing. There's so many of them. The pythons are taking over. Why? It's a spiritual thing because the pythons are trying to multiply to keep God's people from stepping into the purpose God has for them. Now, why and how do we look at this? Both of these principles are set to oppose our moving forward when we are serious about breaking out to break through. First, the first one uh, <coughs> that rules th is through fear. It attempts to terminate our forward mo uh, movement by snatching us away through fear. When someone is threatened and being snatched away in fear and fear is induced, it's like many of the movies, they create the scenery of fear and it causes you to pull back. Are you hearing me? Now watch this, Psalm 91 verse three, suddenly, and it says, surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. There's a breaker anointing today that must be applied for us to step over. The gate opens, but you have to step over the python so that he doesn't strangle you. See, a python goes after your voice. He strangles its, its victims till it squeezes them and they can't speak. Are you hearing me? And it is the principality that opposes our moving forward is the python. Like the demonic structure that attempts to squeeze the life out of us, this demonic principle tries to take away our breath. Our breath is often a reference as the prophetic word or the prophetic wind of God blowing through us. Ezekiel 32, the wind the prophet spoke to that caused the bones to come together, take shape and begin to live. There is a urgency on the demonic realm of the kingdom of darkness to cause people to be strangled so they can't speak. So the enemy that you're going to face in the days ahead is a python. And you have to understand that you have to cross over the threshold to get into the next promise that God has for you. Have you say, Lord, I want what you've promised for my life. All right. The reason the Python-like principality opposes the prophetic is in order to leave us directionless and lifeless. It, attempts, uh, it attacks us to keep us from the vision to go forward. We begin to feel a sense of spiritual darkness and blindness. When a person loses their breath, they pass out. They can't see. This is where people get overwhelmed and begin to panic and hyperventilate and have a sense of suffocating. How many of you know the church has been smothered and, and, uh, and all the realms of culture, the church is no longer invited to speak. We're not at the table of any of the cultures. Everybody wants to talk about the, the, the seven mountains. I know the people that wrote it. I've been with Bill Bright before he died many times. He was one of the writers of that. So I know this, how it got written and when it got written. But I want to tell you something. Their culture of their time. How many of you have heard of Seven Mountains? Okay. Well, those Seven Mountains were in the culture years ago was attainable. But I don't want those mountains. I don't want the mountain of economics because it's broke. I don't want the mountain of education because it's broke. I want to see God's people rise up and take on the anointing to influence those cultures, not take them back. Because if you take them like they are, you become corrupt like them. Now, you'll just have to study that for those of you who don't understand those things. Now, here's the last piece. It always is when we are being led into new territory our new exploits, that there is a warfare at the threshold. Do you know the word territory is used up here a lot? Do you understand that? That's why I knew this word was for here. To just take that into thought. And, and, and there's a warfare at the threshold. There are those to, that, to oppose our forward progress. When Moses crossed the Red Sea, Pharaoh came in to stop him. 
Acts 4.17. Look at this principality at work to impede John and Peter's breakthrough at the gate beautiful. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that, that from now on they speak to no man in his name. Breath cut off. Do you understand? And then the church is so interested in picking and choosing rather than listening to the will of God. We're picking and choosing and then we look at our pastors and we criticize and we complain and we say they go too long or something like that and we begin to smite the shepherd and the sheep can't stay together. We must repent and realize what a gift God gives us when he gives us pastors who dedicate their life to love the sheep and help them get through the gates. Do you understand that? And I work with pastors all over the world. Think about the meaning of the word threshold. The threshold is where something is where something kicks into action. We use words like the threshold of pain, threshold of new discovery, like Moses, or what we have been talking about, the threshold of the door. It is at this point, it is the point of entry into the next place or the next experience. And we need to be reminded, some things won't fit through this gate. And we have to leave it on the other side. Can you hear that? And this is the end. We must learn that Numbers twenty two twenty six 26 says, the angel Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either right nor left. How many of you here? The angel of the Lord has come and he's at this day trying to make it a narrow path that you don't have all these choices but it's time to drop some things, let go of some things and get ready. That's that, that um, uh, serpent, that Leviathan, that serpent is laying there. That python is laying there and you got to cross over it. It wants to steal your testimony. It wants to steal your word. It wants to steal what the Lord's put in you so that you can't speak. There's power in your words. And when you speak to something, that's why when I tell you these little stories, I speak to things in my city on a regular basis. And when I speak to them, they come to pass. Not because I'm anything. I know where I came from, but I know the power of the spoken word. And I know that God hears my prayers when I declare what is his will. And when I come up against a gate, I just look at it and say, sorry, we're going across how you say, me, Lord? I want to go right on across as the gate. Stay on your feet. I'm going to pray with you right now. Father, we thank you for the anointing. We thank you for this yoke <clears throat> that must be broken right now over this people, Lord. I declare the word of the Lord to this house that there is the day that you will stand at gates. And they are gates that I have pre-ordered, pre-prepared that you would go through. The enemy set those gates. The world set those gates. But I'm going to give you favor and you're going to walk through those gates. And when you do, you will see the serpent rise up. You will see that, that, that uh, python begin to rise up and begin to squash and pull and strangle. Instead, you're going to speak to that thing. And as you do it, that python will let you go and you'll step into new areas that have not been conquered in this region for tens and tens of years because religion has come in and drove away the living spirit of God operating in this region. And because of it, you're going to break uh, years and years uh, of, of crazy doctrines and crazy approaches to the kingdom of God. And you're going to step on top of those things. And when you step through, you're going to break religion and religion strongholds. And instead of the testimony be that the people are hard or stiff necked, you're going to see the Lord's going to soften the hearts. Uh, and they're going to say, here am I, Lord, use me. And there's going to rise up a radical Christian uh, uh, movement in this region. It's not going to be Christianity as the past, but it's going to be Christianity that has the anointing
anointing on, of God on it, and it's going to break open things, territorial things, things that have been uh, declared, witchcraft that's worked in this region and spoken over this region. It's bound uh, things up. It's bound the people of God up. It's made church hoppers jump from church to church to church and not get grounded and not get solidly committed because there's a spirit over this region. It's a lying spirit. And the Lord says, I've come and I'm going to open a new door and you'll see this door open within three months. And it's a gate, it's a major gate and you're gonna walk through it and you're gonna see the, the word of the Lord come to pass and it's a great gate. It's not an individual gate, but it's a great corporate gate and it will open up because you're willing to say, this is our land, this is our nation and we will not surrender. The Lord says he's going to cause some grace to come, measures of grace to come. Father, I declare over this house a new grace, a new authority, a new word of authority coming out of their mouth. But God, I pray right now against fear and those that would would say, I, I, I don't know if I can give up. No, this is the day to let go. Let God arise. Isaiah said it. Let God arise and the Gentile will be drawn to you. There'll be people that'll come to you. Pastor, there are gonna be people, uh, Tom, Apostle Tom, there's gonna be people that come to you and they're gonna come to you with great means and they're gonna ask you, they're not gonna join your church, but they're gonna ask you, what can they do to help what you're doing? You're gonna see favor come. There's doors. Uh, listen, I'm going home and I'm meeting with a grandson of the wealthiest man in my state I led him to the Lord when he was 92 years old. He handed my wife and I the keys to a 270 acre farm and he wanted me to have it, to use it for God. And I handed him the keys back because the Lord showed me that his two children were, were like an octopus and they would try to, to strangle me from doing what God told me to do. And I gave the keys back to him. And the live-in nurse who was in my worship team, she heard the two children say, after I had said that, if if dad gives that land to that preacher, we're gonna make his life hell. Now the grandson of the very person who was one of those kids who made that statement has called up and said, can I meet with you? Now this kid is wealthier than anything you can imagine. Why is he meeting with me? I don't have the full story, but I understand God opens these doors because he wants to do something that eclipses what our little teeny minds have said in the past. We've seen the wealth go to the great, uh, you know, this area especially, you know, uh, with Gates and all those kind of people. We've seen that wealth and we've stood back and, and Bozo, uh, whatever his name a bozo the clown, you know, anyway, uh, you know, he buys a $300 million yacht and, and, and we all, oh, God says, can I not do what they think they can do with their hand? We need to change the way we think. And I can tell you how I've watched God do supernatural things. And open doors, there is no way. This is a day that God's going to open a gate. And that gate will be obvious. And you will stand there and go, my God, this is only by God. I declare to you this a new day. How many of you want to agree with me right now that you want a breakthrough? How many of you want a breakthrough right now? You want to change. How many of you are tired of your normal Christianity? You're tired of your just routine Christianity. Something fresh needs to come. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now a refreshing touch of your glory, God, your presence, God. Come over those that will pray, those that will intercede, those that will stand in the gap, make up the hedge. Lord, I thank you for the anointing that will come over those that that will decide, this is my change. I'm going to go through the gate. I'm going to step through. I'm going on 
the other side. And when that serpent rises up, in the name of Jesus, I have authority over that. If I pick up any deadly thing, it shall not harm me. I'm going to do like Paul did. When the serpent rises up, I'm going to fling it right into the fire. And I'm going to be free to go across. I'm breaking out of the old tradition. I'm breaking out of the religious cone that I've been in. I'm breaking out of this tired, dried up, old way of doing Christian things. I'm going to be a new creature in Christ Jesus and all things are going to pass away. My prayer life's going to change. My word life's going to change. Uh, I'm going to begin to see signs and wonders. Use my hands, Lord. Anoint my hands. Uh, put the power of God in the hands of your people tonight, Lord. Put the fire of God there and may we rise up and may we see the miracles we believe for. May we testify of them. May this house have a weekly testimonial time where people are going to testify. I did this and God met me. I gave away that and God blessed me. I turned to this one and they got saved. Family members came in. This is going to be a change time. And I come here tonight to announce to you, you will testify this message. This night was the night that something broke and began to change. So Father, I pray right now, break every stronghold, every lying spirit, every demonic force that would hinder the people of God from being fully released into the purposes that you have for this body, for this call, for this nation, for this area. Father, let these territories come back to the kingdom of God. Let these territories come back to the kingdom of God. Father, I thank you for the anointing tonight, and I pray right now. Let me just pray with any of you standing here. If you are struggling, you just can't seem to get past the day, you just close your eyes a minute and just listen to what I'm going to say. You can't get past where you've been. You can't get past that, that point that you just keep going up to it, and it stops you. I, I have a breaker anointing, and I, I want to pray over you. So if that's you, you say, you know, Pastor, I, I just can't. I just can't. I keep coming back, and I keep trying. I keep stepping into it, and it just stops me, but I need a breakthrough. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's a family thing. Maybe it's just your own attitude. Maybe it's your brain. Maybe it's just things like that that you just can't seem to shake that off. If that's you, you're bold enough. We'll take a couple of minutes. Come right here right now. Just come right now. I'm going to pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the anointing. It's the anointing that breaks yokes. And I declare with you, I'm declaring with you, I'm declaring with you. You can pray with them anytime you want, but I'm just going to take this minute. Tom, you okay with this? Okay. Now, this is a lot of people. My God, the rest of the church. Those of you just sitting there, look, just fake it. Get up here. We don't, don't. We don't need anybody sitting out there. Come on. Right. The whole church came. My God. I was in a Baptist church one time and I was preaching about getting saved and I gave an altar call. The entire church came to the altar. And you know how the miracle of God worked? This is a real true story. My wife's sitting there. A big woman. I call him fluffy. A, a, a fluffy woman. A large fluffy woman fell through the floor. One leg went through the wooden floor, went right on through and she's caught. And these two deacons were trying to pick her up and they're getting their arms around her. And every time they pulled, the wood would catch her leg and she'd go, ah! well, they thought that was a revival. And so as they shout, she shouted, they came closer. As she shouted, even the pastor came to the altar. I, I looked back there and I saw these men. I said, Lord, let them keep pulling on that woman. The entire church got saved. <laughs> Laughter doeth good like a medicine. Amen. But I'm here tonight to be serious for a minute. God wants to do something. You should not be carrying around excess baggage. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to go home. You're going to write down on a little piece of paper. And, and Pastor Tom, I hope this is all right. Could you put something at the door on the outside tomorrow? One of the guys maybe do that. And, and when you come, you take that piece of paper and you drop it at the door and you say, Lord, this is that baggage. I'm not carrying it anymore. You leave it and come in. I guarantee you, you better be ready. The church will be lit. 
Father, in the name of Jesus. Now, I'm going to pray for you. Come on, close your eyes. Stop looking at me. This is not a spectator sport. Father, in Jesus' name. (laughs) Thank you, Lord. Bless her, Lord. Oh, God, thank you, Father. Lord, I thank you right now. Lord, let there be an anointing. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you, Father. Lord. Father, touch this man. There's been a lot of years you've walked with God. Lord, touch him, Lord. Give him strength. Heal those things that are broken, God. Every relationship that's been broken, God, heal it tonight, Father. Bless her, Lord. Father, I thank you for the anointing right now. Lord, I loose these people tonight in faith. I pray that they take that little piece of paper and bring it tomorrow with an expectation I'm done with this. I'm done with this. I've carried it to the altar over and over and over again. And this is the end. I'm bringing it. I'm putting it in that bucket. And I'm going to be done with this. It's not going to torment me. It's not going to harass me. Any longer, I'm going to be free in the name of Jesus. How many of you already know, just standing there in prayer, how many of you know that piece of baggage? How many of you got it in your head? You know what it is. You write it down. I don't care if it's some secret thing. Write it and fold it. Don't write your name on it. (laughs) See, that's just you trying to claim it. Don't put no name on it. Hello? You're a crab and you're grumpy and you just write it down. I'm getting rid of that grumpy attitude. And, and, And whatever it is, just write it down, fold it up, put it in there. When you come in, how many of you heard of Joseph Garlington? Anybody ever heard of him? Great preacher. Uh, he's at my house. He'll be at my church um, tomorrow, on Monday. And <clears throat> I was at his church and I was preaching and I got a word, put a ribbon across the back door. So everybody that walked in on Sunday had to bow down. He called me and said, ain't nobody got in the church. I said, oh, gosh, what, what's, what's wrong? He said, nothing wrong. They're all on piles at the door. They can't get in the building. I said, oh, okay, well, just move the church, the pulpit back there and have church back there. Because when you act on faith, God will honor your faith and he will show you that he's still God. Bless the people, Lord. Let them receive this word. And let this be a breaker anointing passed on to this church in Jesus' name. Come on, let's give the Lord praise tonight. Uh, Go back to your seat, (laughs) whatever. (laughs) Don't you bring that thing in tomorrow. I'm gonna ask the Lord to tell me who has it. If you bring it in, I'm going to call you out. How many were blessed? We'll have that out there. I really challenge you to obey that in faith and do that. And then, like, like you said, don't pick that thing back up. The Bible talks about resist the devil. Some of that is power. The reason it's so hard to drop that is there's power connected to it. But he says, he's, he, you, can, you can resist. Listen, you can resist. Yeah, you have to choose in your, in your will to say, I'm done and resist. I'm not saying that there won't be a battle that ensues that says, pick it back up. Oh, you know you want me, pick me back up. You know, he says, resist and he will flee. Okay? How many say, I agree. I have the power to resist. And the devil has to flee in Jesus' name. Tomorrow at 10, we'll be back together. Um, I I believe you're going to be blessed. Uh, Invite someone. Maybe even when you're leaving here, say, hey, listen, you need to come. Come to church with me tomorrow. You're going to be blessed. Uh, So tomorrow at 10, and then um, tomorrow night at 6, we're going to be in Tacoma. We will be. um, It's going to be a special time to, to, to dedicate the building. Uh, my wife, Apostle Israel, will be with us um, to commission my wife as a, an apostle and um, as we enter into that season. Um, and then um, we will have a message from um, Bishop Bart, and we're just kind of a good old time. Amen? 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 All right. May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Lead you by his spirit and fill you to peace. Amen? All right. We'll see you tomorrow at 10. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you were blessed and encouraged. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And subscribe to our YouTube channel for more amazing content.